What do you think? Will the pandemic cause churches to tank? Welcome to WCKS, where we can't keep silent about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Michael Russell, and I appreciate you joining me. This week, we're going to be going uh, through a couple of articles that I came across. One was published on August 17th, the other on the 27th, both in 19, or in 2020, uh, and both related to church attendance in the midst of this pandemic and some opposing views on whether after this whole lockdown is over, if in-person church attendance would rebound or not. One of the articles was called, quote, Will the coronavirus permanently convert in-person worshipers to online streamers? They don't think so. End quote. This was published by the Fact Tank News in Numbers organization, which is part of Pew Research um, Group, the Pew Research Group. The second article was published on ChristianHeadline.com. However, uh, it was also um, pulled in from a uh, different organization, which I'll get to in a little bit. But it was done by uh, Barna President, and the title of it was Barna President, five, uh, One in Five Churches May Shut Their Doors Because of the Pandemic. Now, both of these articles reference the pandemic and attendance habits during the projected, during and projected after the season passes. The Christian Headlines article, the Barna article, focused on things like giving being down and projections that people may not return after the pandemic. So giving will either continue to be down or go further down. The Fact Tank article focused on church attendance specifically versus online streaming after the pandemic. Due to the amount I am choosing to cover this actually, this episode will actually be broken into two parts. The first one will, will primarily focus on the attending in person part of the argument. The second episode, which will be next Monday, uh, Labor Day, it will be posted, uh, will be related to financials, the giving. And remember, um, the goal of this um, uh, podcast is to look at uh, circumstances in life, challenges in life, and so on, and bounce it up against Scripture. As Christians, we want to know what Scripture has to say, and we want to be obedient to what Scripture has to say, and let it shape us, let it shape our worldview. Some of the statistics and projections from both articles, I want to look at the, you know, what Scripture has to say about these, specifically related to these topics. In addition, I want to note that some months ago, Probably back in April, I happened to come across a Bill O'Reilly YouTube post, and I'm not a, a avid Bill O'Reilly YouTube watcher. It just was a post I came across. And in the course of his little commentary, he predicted church attendance will be significantly down after this pandemic, uh, pandemic ends. Now, I tried to find that to just get a little bit more detail, but I was unable to find it. However, the point simply is, what is the basis for these projections and these predictions? What does or what would it say about those churchgoers? Does the Bible have anything to say about these topics, such as in-person church attendance or financials and how all that should be done? So lots to discuss. Let's start with the article published first. With the coronavirus permanently, will the coronavirus permanently convert per, uh, in-person worshipers to online streamers? They don't think so. That's the title of the article. Now, in this article, which was, again was published by the Fact Tank News in the Numbers organization on August 17, 2020, again, part of the Pew Research Group, it starts right off with some facts. Quote, one third of U.S. adults have watched religious services online or on television in the past month, and little over half of them, or 18 percent of all adults, say they began doing this for the first time during the coronavirus pandemic, end quote. 
Now, the article goes on to report, quote, nine out of 10 Americans who have watched services online or on TV in the past month say they are very satisfied, 54 percent, or somewhat satisfied, 37 percent, with the experience. And only 8 percent say they are not too satisfied or not at all satisfied. And that's according to a recent Pew Research Center survey conducted in mid-July 2020. There are several statistics put out in these articles. And the fact is, statistics are great, but they need to be understood in their context. What are they really telling us? How are the questions asked? And so on. However, the articles continue. There was a quip in one of them that just as online buying has increased or online schooling or, or online entertainment or even online work, so will online church. Online church attendance will continue in the same fashion in the 21st century, the article quips. However, it quickly counters that sentiment by saying, quote, but that's not what the people who've been worshiping online see in their future. On the contrary, most adults overall say that when all the pandemic is over, they expect to go back to attending religious services in person as often as they did before the coronavirus outbreak, which is good, end quote. That's goodness as far as I'm concerned. Now, the article has other stats in it suggesting that those who were not going to church before the pandemic aren't planning to go after, and that was about 43% of those surveyed, while those who were already going to church before the pandemic continue to plan on returning, that was about 42%, and then 10% of them say they, they plan on going even more. Maybe they got a little Jesus in them, a little worried about their mortality, whatever the reason, praise the Lord, but then about 5% anticipate going less. The article summary ends with a note that none of us knows for sure what will happen. So all these projections and prognostications are, are not godly prophecy. They're just anecdotal, uh, you know, based on some algorithm, what they project. And some of it is more than likely human behavior. This is what we're, we're expecting to see because this is kind of typical for us to see. But it goes on and quote, says just 2% of the pre-pandemic regular attenders think that in the long run, they will watch services online or on TV more often and attend in person less often than they used to. So only 2% suggest that they will reduce the amount of times they are actually in person. So that's the gist of that article much of which I quoted to you. It wasn't a super long article. I did not go into the actual research data. I just took what was in the article. And it's noteworthy to mention that this article did not address finances at all. This is the first of those two that were posted, the one on the 17th. Okay. The article I first came across was from ChristianHeadlines.com website, but it quoted from Christian Post article, where Barna group president David Kinneman gave several stats to suggest church giving is significantly down and continues to go down to the point where he is suggesting as coronavirus pandemic, uh, I'm sorry, as many as one in five churches could close as a result of the shutdown stemming from the coronavirus pandemic. So now this is the second posted article, the 27th, but it had a primary article out of ChristianHeadline.com, which referenced a secondary article from the ChristianPost.com, okay? And it was in that ChristianPost.com article that the interview took place with Barna Group President David Kinneman. Sorry about the confusion there. So in addition to several comments and facts noted in that article, one was, quote, one parameter, he explains, was how there has been a drop in belief among pastors that their churches will survive the pandemic. 
going from 70% reporting that they were very confident they would survive the pandemic down to 58 now reporting that they are very confident. So early in the pandem pandemic, a bunch of pastors were surveyed and 70% of them felt very confident that they're going to weather the storm and their church will be fine. Now, as it has prolonged months, only 58% of those same surveyed feel confident that their church is going to survive. Hmm. Another stat mentioned was that one poll taken, quote, found that near, nearly two-thirds of churches have seen a drop in giving since mid-March. Since mid-March, guys. If you remember here in America, here in California, I'm in California, the pandemic really started getting noticed in February-ish, and I believe it was March-ish when all of a sudden the shutdowns happened. People, you know, the the flatten the curve and all that in America where we had to uh, not overwhelm our hospitals and all that. So stay, stay home, don't work, and, and all that. So it appears, based on this, that the numbers immediately started really tanking. First thing people thought of, it appears, and this is just my projection, you better save your money. <laughs> First thing they think of, up, oh, stop giving to the church. And we'll get to that next time. So of these declining declines in giving, quote, an NAE survey of about 1,000 churches found that 34% of churches reported a decline in giving by 10 to 20% or more. 22% reported a, a decline of 30 to 50% or more. And 9% reported a drop of 75% or more in giving. Hmm. Okay, quite a lot to take in for both uh, just the online versus in person and now the financial piece. There's a lot here. But I want to see what we can glean from Scripture to see what God has to say about all of this related to church attendance in person and giving. Remember, this podcast's mission, again, is to examine the many challenges life brings us and take those to Scripture so that we can, as Christians, be educated from Scripture on what we ought to do or how we ought to act or, or uh, conduct ourselves. So I want to start by reminding us of a couple of those Scriptures. The first one is John 14. In verse 15, Jesus is speaking and he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Pretty straightforward. And you might wonder, why am I going there? Well, later in John chapter 17, and he's praying to the Father, and he says, verse 14, John 17, 14, he says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth, your word is is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. So clearly, Jesus is making the statement, your word, God, is truth. John chapter 14, verse 15 that I read, if you love me, you will obey my commands. His commands inc are included in his word, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> and his word is truth. So as we wrestle with life and the circumstances of life and bring that circumstance to Scripture, to, to let it sift through the fingers of the Word, the fingers of Christ himself, let that Word shape us. The Word is truth. It's truth. And let us obey it, showing our love for our Lord and Savior. Amen? Two great passages of Scripture. Granted, it is only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can keep God's commandments. I get it. And it is by Christ keeping God's commandments, taking on our sin, dying in our place, rising from the dead, breaking the power of sin and death, that we even are able to be saved and strive to obey God's commandments. Again, it's through the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember, for those who believe in Christ, 
we gain the righteousness of Christ. He gains our sin and pays the debt at the cross. And in turn, as we believe in faith that he paid the debt, we are sinners. We repent. We turn away from it. We don't practice sin anymore. We confess it to God and we beg him to fill us with his spirit to save us. His righteousness is applied to us. What a benefit we have. What a gift. All of this is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember, those who believe in Christ, who gain that righteousness of Christ, are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, as it says in Ephesians 1, 14 and following, and are given the ability to resist the devil and he will flee. You remember that passage? And we are able, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to exercise self-control. Remember what Paul says in one of his epistles, one of his letters, that I beat myself like a boxer. I beat myself into submission to mortify myself, to, to get rid of the evil and wickedness and sin that I commit in order to be pure and holy. Not to be saved. Christ does that. God does that. But to be sanctified, set apart. Again, through the power of the Holy Spirit. God sanctifies us, but we have a role to play. So let's back to the get back to the topic at hand. Let's start with church attendance. This episode is focused on church attendance. Next episode, we'll deal with church finances. Is it important to meet together? Isn't it all the same if I just listen to the pastor's message online and I'm good to go? As I was pondering the episode, there were so many passages that came to my mind that I just, you know, obviously I'm trying to keep these to around 30 minutes. So the first one that I want to bring up is Proverbs 18. And it says, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. I am sure that several of you listening are listening and resisting this proverb, saying, what the heck? However, think about it. When you're planning for a weekend, or, or you're, you're planning a day off, or maybe you just are coming home for the uh, busy, rough day, and you just want to unwind and be alone. Frankly speaking, you just want to be alone. So what do you do? You, you know, maybe uh, go upstairs, um, get into your office or, or a quiet place, your, uh, your uh, man cave or your she shed or whatever you want to call it. You go somewhere to isolate yourself. And that's satisfying your own desire. And I, and I don't think anyone listening to me right now would have a hard time with that. I think if you do, you're, you're not being honest here. When we do something like that, I, you know what? You know what, honey? I just need some time. I just need to, to get, you know, get away and do my own thing for my own benefit here. So to ice, the first part of the, the, the proverb, to isolate yourself is an active thing we do. It's not like I'm saying, hey, you go to your room and, and you don't get to participate in the party, which then I am isolating you. But the passage says, whoever isolates himself. So this is something the person is doing. Now, the second half of it is where we have a difficult time. It says, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. Breaks out against all sound judgment. That's the part I think most of us are going to struggle with. And I get it. It's a difficult one. But if God's word is truth, and this is truth, this is God's word, then our response shouldn't be, nah, I don't buy that, and walk away. Our response needs to be, I don't quite understand that. Help me understand it, Lord. Prayerfully, you know, teach me what this means, Holy Spirit. And we dig into it. So let me take you to the writer of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians. They happened to live in Rome, and they were being persecuted. This is The book of Hebrews was written just before 70 AD, which is the fall of Jerusalem, when the Romans really came down on, the, on Jews, but also on Christians. Okay? And the writer of Hebrews is experiencing uh, his church, or their, their church of Jewish Christians that are being persecuted, and they're beginning to pull away from the faith. They're beginning to stop showing up and different things like that. And he's trying to exhort them 
not only the the importance and truth of who Jesus is, the whole first chapter of Hebrews is probably the most theologically stuffed about the deity of Christ. It is so awesome. And he's building the case that, guys, this is real. Jesus is God the Son who came to earth to become a creature. The Creator became a creature and died in our place. This is real. And now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. This religious thing of ours is a real relationship with God. Do not forsake it. Do not forsake it. So in Hebrews chapter 3, we pick it up and it says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. What a passage, guys. What a passage. And it's a challenge to us. If you turn away from that practice of fellowship and, and worship of God, you're suggesting that you're not a believer. You never came to faith. Okay? Now, as the writer of Hebrews continues to build upon this, uh, the, the idea of bringing them back to understand this faith, this 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 religion that we follow, he takes them through passages that talk about the priesthood and how Jesus is the great high priest, uh, greater than any of the priests in the order of Aaron, and uh, you know that that we need to stand firm in Him. That that God, uh, Jesus is is divine. He's God, and and all these things. He's exhorting them to follow and believe and stay firm. And we get to chapter ten, verse nineteen and following. We say. Therefore, this is uh, the writer of Hebrews, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Verse 24, And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. What a passage, folks. You see, the, the, the writer of Hebrews is exhorting them not to give up hope and not to shrink away from fellowship with one another, in-person fellowship with one another, especially, especially in times of trial and persecution. Remember, our hope is not in this world. Our hope is is in eternity with God. Our hope is not here. Our home is not here. It is anticipating a new heaven and a new earth. Anything that keeps us from our worship and fellowship with each other is not of God. It is of the devil. Let's look at another passage in Acts chapter 2. Remember, Acts documents the beginnings of the first Christian church. Right after Christ died, rose again, and 40 days later, he ascends into heaven. And just before he ascends into heaven, he gives the Great Commission, Matthew 28. Go into all nations, make disciples of all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them all that I have taught you, and surely I will be with you to the end of the age. And then Acts picks up, Acts chapter 1 picks up, and, and they watch him ascend into heaven. And he tells them, stay here in Jerusalem until I send the, the helper, the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 2 is Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes and empowers each one of them. And then they go out and Peter preaches it like nothing else in Acts chapter 2. Then we pick up after that whole preaching scenario. And it says, verse 40, uh, 42, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. 
and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. What a section of scripture, guys. Notice they were gathered together. They took care to love one another. And that fanned into flame this, this hunger for this fellowship. And, and not only the fellowship to care for one another, but more importantly, to worship God together, to have communion together, to, to have supper together, to praise together, to worship together. And as we move through the book of Acts, we, we see the church growing and the church is now starting to suffer more persecution. And as we move into Acts chapter 4, we get to a story where Peter and John are, are working their way into the temple and they see this beggar, this guy that's been crippled for 40 years. And he begs for alms, for, for money. And they turn and look at him and they basically call out the Lord to heal him. Gold, silver, I do not have, but what I have I give to you. Rise and walk in the name of Jesus Christ. And the man springs to his feet and he's hopping around and everyone's amazed. And they go into the temple and he goes with them. Keep in mind that people that were crippled or, or deformed could not go into the temple. So now he's healed and he goes into the temple with them. Well, everyone's astonished and they come around and a big gathering comes and Peter takes no, no time to start preaching it. He starts preaching it right there and it didn't take long for the leaders, the Sadducees and, and leaders to come and shut them down. And they actually arrest Peter and John for preaching. Put them in jail overnight, bring them out, and they start questioning them and basically telling them they got to stop talking. They got to stop this Jesus stuff. And the response picks up in Acts four nineteen. It says, but Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God... You must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Praise the Lord. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old, which, which means he'd been around town for years and everyone knew it, so there's no way to hide the fact He's now healed and walking around. Now listen, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. And we'll skip down to verse 31. And it says, and when they had prayed again together, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Praise the Lord, people. So you see this fellowship now not only serves to support and build up when the people, are God, people of God are coming together prayerfully and obediently, but God also empowers them and moves them to continue to go out and fight the battle, which he has already won, remember. Remember, God is our front and our rear guard. Remember, God is the one who brings victory. We are simply being obedient. And he gives us that strength. Now, time permitting, we could go through hundreds of passages to support the need to gather together in person. And I submit to you that anything that causes us to stop this fellowship and praise and worship of God is of the devil. Now, before you shut me off, I also want to add, in this time of pandemic and COVID-19, which is a real virus and it can kill, I want you to be sensitive to the fact that some that are sick or shouldn't be in fellowship with others, I get it. They, they need to maybe quarantine themselves. So don't, even though this is an imperative that we should meet together, this is a command. Do not forsake the gathering together of believers, which some are in the habit of doing, Hebrews chapter 10. 
just because of that doesn't mean we shouldn't be wise stewards and stay home if we have some infectious disease and not simply infect everyone else. In fact, what we should do is call the elders and have them come out and pray over us. Okay, that's what scripture says. So understanding that, the point of today's episode relates to those articles. And the first article that we mentioned is the one that suggests that after the pandemic, people are more comfortable with streaming Sunday service than going in and being with the people. And what I'm challenging is that alone is not biblical theology. That is laziness. That is like that Proverbs 18 passage. You're purposely isolating yourself from the fellowship, and that is sinful. Okay? This concludes this episode. Hopefully you're not too fired up at me, but so fired up that you'll come back next time. (laughs) I truly appreciate you do coming, that you have come. And next week we'll be looking at the second part of this that's related, and that's on the side of giving. So I look forward to having you back in that discussion. Be blessed. I appreciate you joining me today for this episode. Please follow the channel and share it with others. And join me for the next post. Until then, be blessed.